This program is one of many produced for external students at the University of New England. Cassettes are available for purchase. For further details, contact Jeff Arger, Course Development Advisor, University of New England, Armadale, 067 73 2680. But the main problem is what to do after that note, because that comes as such a surprise. You mm. were, you've come to, from this oh, very flat yeah. section, then you do this thing, and it, it's gone in the do, da 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 and then it's over. Yeah. Like, how do, you, how do you see the moment after the piece is finished? Mm. Kind of a strange yeah. place to start. Yeah, no, sure. But, um, mm. Yeah. Um, well, I see it as a, I see it as a, yeah, like it has to have a really neat a closing happening. gesture or something or other, rather than being lift up in the air. So um, my f the way I, I hear it, or the way that I imagine it, is that it's really not much more different from this kind of thing. So the two kind of ideas eventually meld. I mean, this is really only just doing that sort of little shape, mm -hmm. except it's written out now. And it has a slightly wider ambit. And it's only this thing that kind of starts to herald some kind of closing figure. Right, so you tend to kick it on and close it naturally with, with a longer note. I, I just... Uh, That's the way you feel it? That's a short note. Yep. No, no, I better go back a little ways. No, uh, not no, too no, good, right. right? Right, could you maybe just break a little bit before that? Yep, that's the way I hear it. But that, that, that's the way I hear it. That yeah, doesn't. I, that, I, that, I, yeah. I, I, okay. I'll have to think about that because. Because that mightn't work in performance. I mean, the, the performance thing, as you did, is more like natural because of the way you're moving. Coy, or it's too sure. Um, but yeah, I can. I'll have to think of a better of a shorter note. I mean, I, I just didn't want. If you're pulling back, as you say, you're pulling it really back. I didn't want a really a long. I, I didn't. <laughs> Well, the stimulus was the fact that I was holidaying in the islands of uh, the Aeolian Islands, above Sicily, and uh, the very the very fact it was summer, it was warm, um, it was an incredible spot. It was an atoll, a volcanic atoll, sitting out in the middle of the sea, and you can capture that feeling of being isolated, but in this amazing place. I kind of heard about the fact that quite a lot of uh, German artists and um, musicians used to hang out there, basically. And um, so we went there just to take a break from where we were living in the mountains in the valleys at that time. And um, so it was just great, get to the sun, the south of Italy, and it would be fantastic. The two people that I was staying with in their house um, were painters. And they were painting, they took that opportunity to paint in watercolors, because in the mountains and the valleys you paint in oils. And when you go to the sea, the light changes. And so the kind of the actual what you do in terms of your craft changes according to the, to the locale. And, uh, and so that sort of sparked it off. And I was feeling very much in that kind of mood. I'd been working on a, on a large kind of um, chamber ensemble piece that had been going for a few years at that point. And it was very thick and, and large and all of that stuff. And I was just really glad to be away and sort of think of something in small terms. Um, the greatest influence was that I was reading um, a book that I'd um, found in the house that was um, part of the library there, and, um, and it was a text by um, a Japanese writer, Zayami, and uh, it was really a manual on no drama. The way that it was expressed in Italian se seemed to capture the sort of the romance part, part of the language, seemed to capture the imagery that I thought was innate or would be innate in the um, in the original text, because it tends to talk a lot in metaphor. One of the things that um, struck me, or had a great resonance with me, is that um, it talked about um, the essence, or art, or when the, that first flowering of talent occurs in an actor and how this uh, first burst, this first bloom, is uh, fairly short-lived. It might only last, it might appear in that period between 10 and 20 years old. And then after that, the actor has to invoke technique and adopt a different conformant to make it 
last to rebloom, but for a longer period that might last a lifetime. Now that um, essence of the artist, of the actor, um, was conveyed by this phrase um, in, that was in the manual, and it talked about um, uh, the flower, um, il fiore. And uh, so in reading this text, I came across this kind of um, this phrase, lo specchio del fiore, and meaning that um, lo specchio literally is the mirror, and then uh, il fiore is the flower. And uh, I was kind of thinking along those lines. And, um, and so what, how all this came together in a way for me in the piece was that I was surrounded by very um, particular kinds of, and a particular, very particular environment, very particular kinds of people. And it sort of seemed to be um, the kind of accumulation, or it seemed to be the climax of a period of watching and living in Italy. And I'd noticed that, and because I'd mainly lived in villages, so I noticed that village folk in particular tended to be almost characters in, in plays. It was a play of real life. But they were so stylized, and, and then suddenly for me that connection between um, Commedia dell'arte, which is really a folk theatre, um, or had its roots in the popular idiom, and then no, so you couldn't get anything further apart, but it seemed to me that the actual stylizations that happened seemed to be the one and the same thing, except complementary aspects. And so this highly kind of synth synthesized almost, uh, an abstract um, manner, Seem, seemed to me to make a lot of sense and that's how and so I, I suddenly tuned into that and I started looking for that um, sort of thinking about how I could express that in musical ideas that I've actually loaded the music or the actual notation with as much as I can possibly can uh, in terms of that aspect of the craft of composition. But I think um, a certain amount of the, the energy or at least a certain um, idea behind the piece has to be imparted. I wanted the performer to look back inwards in a way and that's what I thought the piece would do by reiterating, by coming back to certain obsessive little phrases that come back or certain sounds. I did initially approach it quite differently, not knowing that. Um, so it was that process of building up and giving these little musical materials emotional charges by re repeats basically, um, that started to, for me to um, take the idea of, of icons, really, that it's just like, you know, I mean, I remember I was, I was raised as a Roman Catholic, and so you go to church, and there are all these amazing images, uh, processions and so on, and these things become incredibly laden with all sorts of meanings. Um, your whole life becomes interwoven with these things, so there are the good times spent with parents, brothers, sisters. So that idea of the icon, that idea of this a little kernel of material that somehow um, uh, captures the essence of a whole lot of things that happen around it um, is how I mean the icon. I use the term icon as a physical object. It has a complex web of meanings that at the same time can be both fixed and changing. The message of the icon is the language of cultural symbols. The physical objects for me are both the sound, the sound of the Baroque flute, and the score, the notated object. They both exist in two dimensions, sound as wave patterns over time, and the score as two-dimensional page with graphic notes on them. My icons, perhaps I perceive more as gestalts, that is, they possess qualities as a whole that can't be described as a sum of the parts. I'd like to show you a couple of examples of what I mean by icons. Here on the screen, I have three different types of icons. Essentially, they're patterns. Traditional methods of music analysis, such as Shankarian analysis, can describe objective events. They work on the score, and they can put in great detail 
the actual events of the music that are happening. When it comes to more like ephemeral notions in music, that is emotional energy, the psychoacoustics, that is the reverberation, the effect on the listener, traditional analysis or traditional methods of analysis run into problems. What I've presented to you is that both on the one hand the objective and the subjective on the other need to come together into a whole. Our minds operate in the same way. We operate both in the left and right hemisphere. And what I would suggest is that musical analysis ne needs to deal with both of these types of phenomena. For example, it would be difficult to explain from a traditional objective point of musical analysis why certain notes in my flute piece, Lo Specchio del Fiore, return. They return almost obsessively. I intended them to be so, to create feelings of pathos, of beauty, of timelessness, this is where traditional musical analysis has problems. Basically, traditional methods of analysis can't glean this kind of perception from the music. In musical terms, my icons are represented as a proto-melody, and an arabesque figure. By proto-melody, I mean a simple, rudimentary kind of tune. It describes a lyrical exposition of the music. My proto-melody is in the form of an arch, representing the life breath, life and death, love and hate, etc. My use of the proto-melody as an icon will become clearer when we move on to look at the arabesque and the geometrical designs which constitute it. By arabesque in music, I mean a highly ornamented or decorated melody. During the course of the piece, the proto-melody returns, but it's not developed as in traditional Western music. Instead, it returns in various guises, reappearing, changing, permutating, but not in the traditional methods of Western uh, traditional music. An arabesque in the visual arts is a type of curvilinear decoration in painting, metalwork, with intricate interwining leaf, flower, animal, or geometrical designs, basically a design of flowing lines. Arabesque geometrical shape designs. Remember that in ancient times, geometry represented numbers in physical space and in motion, hence a representation of the universe itself. Arabesques in symmetrical linear order, notice the graphic outlines of the upper examples analogous to sinusoidal wave shape of pure sound waves. Arabesques in symmetrical, complementary, and inverted designs. Two examples of juxtapositions of two different designs to form an arabesque in form of a palindrome, reading the designs from top left to bottom right, with its centre of the two stars on line two. That is a mirror section pivoting at the centre. Tombs ornamented with arabesques, Samarkand, Central Asian section of the Soviet Union. My score with proto-melody, an arabesque motive from Ravel's opera, L'Enfant et les Sortilèges, the Child and the Magic, used as musical icon. Okay, how did you cope with the cold? <laughs> <laughs> uh, I could have used some of those it little gloves, but that right. fingers on it, that I don't think that'll so work cold. too great. Um, a couple of times the notes broke. Was that because the... Oh, the your, your flute, flutes don't like... When I first uh, met Alyssa last year, uh, for the first time, I saw her in concert. During the, the course of this concert, I was particularly struck at the, at the kind of movements that she made. There was also this visual um, theme that was going on, if you like. I had thoughts of just um, distributing the piece around to various people and just trying to get a performance of the thing, um, but it seemed that it locked in when I saw all this. Out. I have a problem in the sense that I can't actually see or hear the piece beyond Alyssa. I felt there was this letting go of the piece, that it wasn't just mine. The real fun in working in new music comes in uh, what you can contribute to the piece. Uh, and the longer you play it, like what Claudio was saying, um, the, more, the more ideas you get about what he was trying to do. So y your ideas tend to be uh, on a very small scale. They're very subtle things. Um, but with this piece in particular, it had to do with, with um, getting to know the or making sense of the length of time between events and, and setting up some kind of, uh, in a way, a proportional idea in uh, how long a rest should be in terms of the next rest and the next rest, so that the piece does change every time you play it. Well, that's one of the things that's interested me. In fact, the thing, the experience of this piece, 
And I was amazed that somehow the graphic language, the notation that I'd used, it was extremely detailed when I first wrote it. And, uh, and yet, I wouldn't have been able to write it with that detail. It went beyond my wildest imagination. What she'd put, I wouldn't dare have written that much detail into the piece, and yet what she was doing was, was just breathtaking, the way you were shaping dynamics and the most incredible, almost subaudible sub um, levels and then swelling to, to um, loud passages. So. Um